Hello and good evening. This program is Community Board 8 Speaks. CB8 Speaks is a monthly cable cast that explores issues in and around Community Board 8, and that's the area of Manhattan from East 59th Street to East 96th Street, from the east, end, east side of Fifth Avenue over to the East River, and it also includes, includes Roosevelt Island. Now, Manhattan Borough has 12 Community Boards itself. The whole city of New York has 59 community boards across all the boroughs. Uh, the boards are agencies of the city, and all the meetings of the boards are open to the public. It's the lowest level of government, one that everyone can attend and see what's going on. There are 50 members, and they're appointed by the borough president for a two-year term. Applications to become members of the community board are downloadable from the CB8's website, and that is www.cb8m.com. Now you click on the tab that's marked bulletins and then on forms. You can also see a monthly calendar of the meetings that are coming up and these are meetings of the committees of the community board and you can also see the full board uh, meeting schedule. Much of the work of the community board is done with these committee, committees um, and tonight we're going to continue with a series of programs that we have on these committees. Tonight's program is about the Landmarks Committee. Now, Community Board 8 of the Upper East Side has a lot of historic districts and has many, many beautiful buildings. If you read the papers, you're going to be reading a lot about what goes on with the Landmarks Committee. It's a very important committee. In fact, it's one of my favorites. I think it deals with the most wonderful elements of the Upper East Side, which is the architecture. Tonight, Jane Parshall is here. She is the chairperson of the Landmarks Committee. Jane, welcome. Thank and um, please, um, could you uh, get started and tell us a little bit about what the Landmarks Committee does? Well, the Landmarks Committee takes a position on applications that are filed at the Landmarks Commission for certificates of appropriateness. If you own a property within a historic district, and that historic district is within Community Board 8's geographic boundaries. Could be a development project, for instance, putting up a new building or within a historic district, or it could be as simple as a through-the-wall air conditioner in a, on a rear elevation that can barely be seen. But if you are within a landmark district and it is visible from the public way, you must apply to the Landmarks Commission for a Certificate of Appropriateness, a C of A. And then, once you are calendared at the Landmarks Commission, it comes back to the Community Board, the Landmarks Committee, as the first step in the public hearing process. And we, at the committee level, actually have a hearing on this issue, whether the Certificate of Appropriateness. I'll give you an example because I brought some agendas. One that would be, I think, familiar to a lot of our listeners is 266th Street, the Manhattan House. Mm -hmm. Recently became an individual landmark at the Landmarks Commission, first coming to us for a vote. They wanted to do some work on their circular driveway out in front, a restoration, and redo some of the planting. Because it's a landmark building, an individual landmark, it came to us first for a hearing. The developer brings his lawyer, an architect, and in this case also a landscape architect. They make a formal presentation with maps and drawings and elevations and planting schemes, and they also must bring a materials board so that we can see what the concrete pavers might look like, what the even the fence material used for the fence, in this case it was a wrought iron fence, so we see the materials. Our committee, which has about nine members right now, then takes a vote. We hear, hear from the public first, then we go to the committee and talk about the issue amongst ourselves, and then we take a vote, and that becomes the results of that vote become part of the resolution that then goes to the full board meeting, as you explained, there are 50 members, which is usually held the following Wednesday. We meet on the third Monday of the month. The full board meets on the third Wednesday of every month. The very exciting issues, 
some very high profile, for instance, 980 Madison, the Sotheby's building, the vertical enlargement, which was covered extensively in the Times and the other metropolitan newspapers. But you can have something as banal as an air conditioner. But if it's visible from the public way, it comes to us. And that means that it's either an individual landmark, the Manhattan House is not within a historic district, 980 Madison, the Sotheby's building, is within the Upper East Side Historic District, so it comes to us. We have the Carnegie Hill Historic District, we have the Metropolitan Museum Historic District, we have the, um, the Upper East Side Historic District, which is really the biggest geographic area within the Community Board 8 area. How do you interact with the Landmarks Preservation Committee? The commission, you mean, the commission, LPC? Yeah. Look, forgive we me, don't I don't know much about it, and we're depending on you to, to tell us. Well, the Landmarks Preservation Commission is pretty powerful. And as you know, we've had um, a mayor who's been very pro-development. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, I personally feel the Landmarks Commission has not been as sort of community-oriented as it could have been within our historic districts. Um, but they are the city agency that has a staff that is responsible, one, for creating landmark districts and also individual landmarks, monitoring what goes on. For instance, if you live within a historic district, say the Carnegie Hill Historic District, and you as a homeowner decide that you want to change a window even at the ground floor on the street, and you don't go to the Landmarks Commission for your C of A, the Certificate of Appropriateness, you could get a violation. Mm -hmm. And then we at the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 8 take a very dim view of property owners who do not go and get file for the C of A's and start work that then becomes in violation. And we, we really don't like that. We usually turn them down mm. because we feel that people should be sophisticated enough to know that they're living either in a landmark building or within a historic district. And we feel that historic districts actually create economic value for the property owners within the districts. Um, with um, You mentioned a couple of the, the news items that uh, some people have been familiar with the Sotheby's building. Yes. Um, can, you, can you tell the audience some of the other um, big issues that you've dealt with? Well, we had the Guggenheim Museum, which came in for an expansion of a tall vertical tower, in fact. Mm -hmm. And that was approved both at the committee level and at the commission. But thank goodness, I think that Guggenheim realized it wasn't really economically feasible for them, so they withdrew the proposal. And we were very happy about that. But that was very, very high profile. And they had hired a world-famous architect, Renzo Piano, to do the addition. Wow. And um, although he himself did not come, I think he went down to the Landmarks Commission, his number one person in the city, because they do a lot of work in New York City, was there making the presentation. And that's exciting. Um, um, Sotheby's application, 980 Madison, that again, very high profile, very glamorous. The first proposal was for the elliptical towers, which would, as I think um, was quoted in the Times, some of the community residents felt was like a dagger going up into the sky <laughs> and would, would have been visible everywhere, um, even from Central Park West, et cetera. A, ver a lot of very glamorous people came and testified. Larry Gagosian, whose art mm -hmm. gallery is in that building, mm -hmm. and he came to testify. We had many high-profile people, not to mention A.B. Rosen, the developer himself, mm -hmm. and he's a very charismatic, flamboyant personality. So it's fun to see these people, just to, because New York is such an exciting place. It really makes it much more stimulating and interesting than it might be otherwise. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, uh, Many meetings are just very, very what non high profile issues where you want to change your stoop, whether you want to change the um, front elevation, you want to change the windows on the front elevation. If you're within a landmark district, you have to come to us. And again, those aren't high profile, but we do consider everything very thoughtfully, very carefully. We recently had a series of buildings, I think four 
houses on 72nd Street, right up from where the new Ralph Lauren, the woman's shop, mm -hmm. is. Um, he's doing a beautiful job, Ralph Lauren, and putting in a four-story Beaux-Arts building. These were four buildings going up 72nd towards 5th. And um, the developer wanted to put on a rooftop addition. We felt it was so visible from the public way and that it would set a precedent for those houses mm -hmm. in that the other houses on the street might come in and ask for rooftop additions themselves. So we immediately voted it down. Mm -hmm. we w I think of our community board, us at the community level, are pretty preservation minded. And I think you know you attend some of the full board meetings and you see what the votes are mm -hmm. among our committee members. And I like to think that it's a people at the committee give every single issue that comes before it, high profile or not, the same level of attention. We care about the detailing. We care about the materials that the homeowner or the developer is going to be using. And we really believe in context and appropriateness. That's our mandate. We can't get involved with issues involving light or air. We do care about rear elevations because sometimes they're visible through alleyways or whatever. We care about trying to preserve rear yards, although it's really not our mandate. We do care about that. So um, it's very interesting, the issues that come before us. I mentioned 266th Street, the Manhattan House. Yeah. But here we had 110 70th Street, the Upper East Side Historic District, replacement of windows on the front of the building, refurbishing the sidewall, replacing the stucco with bricks to match the front of the building, adding a two-story rear addition. It wasn't high profile. It was a very complicated application. It was divided ultimately into six parts. We voted on each part separately. We give, gave it a lot of, um, I think, care and consideration because we understand that what we are voting on affects the built environment, and those little changes mm -hmm. could be in place for the next 50 or 100 years even. So it's really important to give each application a lot of time, a lot of deliberation. And I think you mentioned the Upper East Side. It's the most, to, I think you live in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. the most exciting, oh, vital, yes. vibrant neighborhood I feel in the entire city. It may not be as exciting to the younger generation as Soho or Chelsea, but for the stability of New York, with the Metropolitan Museum, the greatest museum in the entire world, which is anchors sort of the Metropolitan Museum Historic District and the beautiful buildings on the side streets, giving that sort of Parisian air to that little tiny neighborhood, what could be more exciting than to try to protect it and preserve it for future generations? You make a really good point because it actually would suggests that it's not just for our neighborhood, but for the world. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, you go to a city like Paris, which I use as an example, because mm -hmm. for the core of Paris, there is, you can't practically remove a leaf from a tree without going through an incredibly difficult public approval process. Mm -hmm. And it is my great hope that someday we'll be that strict in New York. My most recent experience, and it's why I got on the community board again, I think around 2004, and have been an active member of the Lamb Arts Committee, most recently being the acting chair, is because I led a single site development issue within a historic district, the Carnegie Hill Historic District at 91st in Madison. Mm -hmm. That was very high profile because we had people involved like Bette Midler and Woody Allen and um, trying to think that wonderful columnist for the Wall Street Journal, Peggy Noonan, mm -hmm. Kevin Klein. It was a very exciting, glamorous moment. It was an issue that was of intellectual interest because you had a collision between the as-of-right zoning along Madison Avenue, the Madison Avenue Preservation District, and the historic district boundary. Mm -hmm. And this building was on a corner. It was a one-floor Citibank branch. And there were air rights that could be developed above the Citibank branch. And a very clever developer came in, Carrie Tamarkin, bought the air rights from Citibank, 
Citibank allowed the developer to build over the branch. The branch could not be closed. It was It's a big profit-making center for in the branch system for Citibank. Mm -hmm. This is was known as an infill building, a corner building, with landmarked Queen Anne houses going north oh, really? and townhouses along 91st Street. 91st Street is one of the most beautiful streets from 5th mm -hmm. Park in the city. You know, the Otto Kahn Mansion, the Burden Mansion, mm -hmm. the Carnegie Mansion, which is now the Smithsonian Museum of Art and Design. And the developer, even though the community board we wanted a contextual building, low in scale, no longer than, no higher than six stories. And the community board, on three separate occasions, supported us, the community. We had a tremendous community effort. 5,000 signatures, every elected official supporting us. The Landmarks Commission turned us down the first time for the tall tower, which was going to be the equivalent of like 19 stories. But after that, they approved what became the tallest infill building in a historic district in the city ever. Mm -hmm. And it's a very mundane building. Better to put that kind of architecture on 2nd or 3rd Avenue. The developer used cheap materials. Oh. You know, he could have used red brick, which is more expensive, and said it was that very banal blondish brick. But this is, was, this is the kind of thing where you can get the community involved when they all show up for public hearings at the committee level. And it's very exciting that people, the neighborhood residents, finally understand exactly what a CFA is, why there is a community board, why there is a Landmarks Commission. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of other interesting experiences lately with expansions of historic districts. Now, those don't come to us as certificate of appropriateness applications. Mm -hmm. They come under new business. A good example would be the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District came to us mm -hmm. because they wanted to expand the Upper East Side Historic District. And that, unfortunately, has not been heard yet at the Landmarks Commission. Mm -hmm. But the Friends of the Upper East Side came to us because they were planning on making an application to for an expansion of an existing historic district at the Landmarks Commission. Mm -hmm. We heard them first as an information item under new business, then we actually had the formal public hearing in July, and we did get, the community really came out, the friends of the um, Upper East Side worked very hard really raised the public interest within our community. They came to us at the public hearing. We heard the public speak. We passed a resolution, which then went to the full board in September. The, the full board passed, it was, I think it was practically a unanimous resolution. Practically, I think there were a couple of no votes. Mm -hmm. It has not yet been heard at the Landmarks Commission. And that's been a tragedy because a building at 65th and Madison the Kane Mansion was just demolished. The owner sold that site oh. to a developer. Mm -hmm. We, the Landmarks Commission, did not act quickly enough to yeah. save this beautiful old house. You know, Governor Kane, the former governor of New Jersey, mm -hmm. that had been in his family. So that was a tragedy. Yeah, they have the scaffolding up, and it's yes, coming down and very quickly. It's I've already noticed. down. I was just oh. past the site. The, it's already oh been gosh. demolished <laughs> totally and completely. Oh. Yes, you live right in that yeah. neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. And that was, I'll tell you, it's my dream house. It only had a garage, and I had well, a I was lucky I enough to that. be inside that house. And what was really? unusual was that, of course, on the side, it was like two lots. It was mm -hmm. very big. And on the front, yeah. I think it was two city lots, yeah. too, the elevation facing Lexington and then the elevation on the side street. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot about um, architecture. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot. Uh, we hear the applications, the shop owners on Madison, if they want a renovation, they'll come to us. Mm -hmm. And then you learn somewhat about the economics of what it's like to be a shopkeeper on Madison. There are very strict guidelines for the shops on Madison, thank heavens. I think, you know, that's why they want to extend the historic district um, up on Lexington, because I think that stretch between 68th Street and maybe going to about 79th Street on Lex, those 10 or 11 blocks, mm -hmm. 
are so charming yeah. and so pretty with their little tiny storefronts and usual not, you know, the big box stores, but sort of the mom and pop shops of true distinction, and they lend so much character and flavor to our city. Oh, absolutely. So, um, well, you know, there's a lot of detail that has to be presented to these committees, and, and you you mentioned like the type of brick and, and the, uh, the elevation, but um, do you need any kind of a special training in architecture? I mean, how what is your, your life outside of the Landmarks Committee? Well, as you know, I teach in a public school, but I do have two sort of Bibles, the AIA Guide to New York City, which is marvelous oh, let's, and let's, contains maps of mm -hmm. all the historic districts, and right. you can see that I have yep. Post-its in here. Right. And we can just turn to any one of these pages. 980 Madison, which I looked up in here, that was the Sotheby's... Um, that is the former Sotheby's Park Burnett building. Originally, the Park Burnett Gallery is later mm -hmm. Sotheby. They give a little history, and they actually give some whimsical detail. Um, the writers uh, do lend some humor, Normville White and Elliot Walensky. For instance, mm -hmm. they say, the Wheeler Williams sculpture pinned on the facade is a dreary gatekeeper, meaning, meaningless art at the portal of art is money. So that's cute. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, you said you might want to know the most humorous moments. It's really coming, reading the entries in this wonderful, wonderful oh, hold it up to, Bible to for anybody yeah. who's interested in the yeah. architecture of New York, the AIA yeah. Guide to New York City, and they have maps of the historic district. Right. I turned down the pages. Not every building that we hear an application on is actually in here, but a lot of them are. So it's really one of my Bibles. Mm -hmm. um, you can see I... And the other Bible you brought? And the other Bible I brought because, you know, they'll come and say, oh, it's a, it was it's a, designed in the Neo-Renaissance style or the Neoclassical yes. style by, yes, yes. you know, some architect. So mm -hmm. this um, is just it tells me exactly what... It's like a dictionary definition of what Renaissance is. And the title what of that is... It's okay. called the Dictionary of Architecture. Okay. And um, it says the world's most trusted reference books are in this series. And I use it a lot if I am curious about a definition for some architectural detailing that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And they'll give you a little, inter a little history as well. Mm -hmm. And they also will give you a little profile if it's a well-known architect. He is also in here. That's great. So you can just look up just about anything you need to know about architecture style or the architect. And they have little drawings, which are very helpful as well. Um, so these are the two books that I try to look at to sort of become more familiar with um, either the building and its little history mm -hmm. or an architectural term or an architect I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. On the, I'm not a trained architect. I think it is helpful to have architects on the committee. And as you know, we now have David Halpern, mm -hmm. who's a very well-respected architect on the committee. And I have learned a lot at the committee level just listening to his point of view when we, we usually get each member of the committee to express an opinion on the project. And I am always all ears when it's time for David to speak because I've learned a lot from him. Oh, that sounds He's cool. a wonderful addition. Our former, um, one of our former co-chairs, Marjorie Perlmutter, is now left the committee mm -hmm. and left our board because she became a member of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Oh. So that was a very exciting moment yeah. for our board. Right. And um, I think she's doing a great job down at the commission. That's wonderful. And she was trained as an architect. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessary. Christina Davis, a former um, co-chair, has served on a lot of not-for-profits that are, are involved in historic preservation. She's on the board of the Friends of the Upper Side Historic Districts. She left being the co-chair because she is now the chair of the Landmarks Preservation Foundation, which mm -hmm. is the private fundraising arm for the Landmarks Commission. So, and they have a wonderful lunch every other year in a historic building. Oh. I think last year, in last year, it was at the Armory. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was in Rockefeller Center, it was in, where the um, Christie's Art Gallery is, because mm -hmm. Rockefeller Center, of course, is a landmark. Mm -hmm. They had it at the Viard Houses. 
I mean, New York, yeah. I do think you get involved in historic preservation architecture, and it is exciting. You know who Robert A.M. Stern is. Mm -hmm. You know about Renzo Piano. You now know about Sir Norman Foster, the very well-known English architect, um, who's, I think, the architect for the New York Times building. So that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, there's no question it's the most interesting experience for me, a layman. Well, I know that, you know, the Upper East Side, we talked, it's world-class neighborhood, but also part of Community Bar is Roosevelt Island. Do you deal with any issues on Roosevelt Island? Well, that is not a landmark yet. Oh. And, I mean, there's there are some individual buildings, I believe, like the Octagon mm -hmm. the, um, building there, which yeah. was part, the, part of one of the original hospitals that were sited there, mm -hmm. is an individual landmark. But I think that was done well before I came onto the community board. I think there is an interest in historic preservation on Roosevelt Island. I know the community board has its April meeting always in the old church there mm -hmm. on Roosevelt Island. But um, it's, the architecture is pretty nondescript well, if you look of, at it. Some of the, there are some ruins of buildings actually in the north end of the island. But yeah, but we so don't really let, get involved with ruins of buildings. Oh, I think that there is a historic really? um, group on Roosevelt Island which mm -hmm. I think tries to keep mm -hmm. the historic sites and buildings in the public eye. Mm -hmm. But in my his, the years I've been on the Landmarks Committee and I, I've never mm -hmm. had seen an application from Roosevelt Island. That's interesting. But it just isn't often old enough. You know, the yeah. neighborhoods that are landmarked mm -hmm. now really, um, well, first, you in, traditionally, you're supposed to be 50 years old before you're eligible for landmark status. And maybe Roosevelt Island meets that bar right now. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. because I think it was developed in the 60s and 70s. It was... Um, Edward Loeb, I remember that, the Roosevelt Island Development Corporation. He had very well-known figure, um, worked for the state, and he was the one who really came in and made I remember when I first came to New York, it was still an island. There were mm -hmm. no apartment buildings on it, I, just I remember, the hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. But it really hasn't been. Um, you look at, like, the Carnegie Hill Historic District, those Beaux-Arts mansions. It's usually been the really wealthier neighborhoods in New York that have sort of been... Um, in the forefront of creating a historic district or the Baker Mansion. You think of the beautiful sites. You know, look through that book. Well, you know, Jane, we are just about out of time, and we haven't even covered half the questions I had. So I'm actually going to say we're going to have to do another edition of your committee on this show. Um, not right away. It was very hard. I really appreciate your coming. It was very difficult to get to the studio. So um, this has just been fantastic. and we really Well, I think it. anything that can lend visibility to the work of the community board, to the work of the committees. It's so important. I think that um, there is a level of apathy, apathy out there. And until you, as a homeowner or as a resident, a renter in the city, are faced with an issue that immediately affects you, in general, you don't become involved with your community. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jane. And good night, everyone. This has been Community Board 8 Speaks. Have a great day.